Have you ever wondered what would happen if bourbon and rum got together and made a illegitimate love child? I have, and that is exactly what is in here. 20 liters of the stuff, to be exact. I'm gonna show you exactly how I made it, and I'm gonna tell you why the stuff is so freaking tasty. How's it going, chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, and this is still at the channel, all about chasing the craft of home distillation. And this right here, guys, this, I'm calling it Love Child. It is mostly bourbon, mostly corn, uh, with a little bit of rum, molasses, mixed into it as well. And to be honest, it was inspired by something called Sweet Feed over on uh, a bunch of the forums. People are making this all over the place. Uh, I decided to go about it in a slightly different manner so I can get the exact ratios of what I want in here. Long-time viewers of the channel will know that I bought this barrel back when I first hit 100,000 subscribers. The Patreons voted on what we should put into it. Love, child. Thank you, Patreons. Well, now that I'm over 200,000 subscribers, who would have thought it, I finally got around to filling the barrel. And I gotta tell you guys, I'm pretty freaking excited about this. So let's get stuck in to the ingredients, shall we? The first and most important ingredient in this recipe is kibbled corn. And uh, some of you may be shocked to find out that this is actually an animal product I am using. I am not in America. I don't have the luxury of uh, subsidized corn falling from the sky. I jest, I'm poking fun, but actually guys, uh, this is a pretty standard practice. If you haven't worked it out yet in the home distilling community, you're going to boil the crap out of it and then you're going to distill it. So we're gonna be using 40 kilos of that stuff. And if you wanna follow along guys, I would suggest you get the kibbled stuff. Whole corn sucks to deal with. The next ingredient, and I'm sure you've guessed this already because I mean, what do you make rum out of? Molasses. Today I'm going to be using about 9 kilos of black strap molasses. And yes, once again, this is animal feed stuff. No, it's not sulfured. No, there's no other additives to it. They tend to keep it pretty simple here in New Zealand. In terms of fermentables, that's it. We are, however, going to be using M1 yeast. And by God, I've been wanting to try this stuff for a long ass time. We're also gonna be using some enzymes because obviously we don't have any barley to uh, bring enzymes to the table. We need something coming out of a bottle. I figured I was gonna need roughly 200 liters of wash to fill that barrel right there. Uh, I do have a 200 liter fermenter. I do not, however, have 200 liter equipment to cook the corn. So this is gonna involve a few batches and a fair bit of time. Obviously, if you wanna scale the recipe down to whatever you know size you want to make, that's fine. If you want to scale it up, please be my guest. So the goal becomes, how do we cook all of this corn? Because we need to gelatinize it before we can let the enzymes do their job. If you have no idea what I'm talking about with gelatinization, uh, you can check this video out up here. That's going to help you out a whole lot. Um, if you can't be bothered watching that, you got to cook the stuff, okay? <laughs> So here's the deal guys, I'm not gonna be using exact measurements for cooking the corn because I just know that I've got two sacks of corn that I need to cook and exactly how much I cook in each time doesn't matter too much. Oh, and of course, all of the recipes are gonna be down in the description below in metric and freedom units, so you don't have to stress out about it, okay? So take the big ass pot, put it on the gas burner, but before we start adding corn to it, you're probably gonna to wanna to mill this again. The reason I suggest using kibbled corn is you can actually get kibbled corn to go through uh, a standard home brewing two roller setup. It's not entirely easy and it might take a little bit of persuasion but it will go through there and your mash is going to be a whole lot more efficient if you can break that down a little bit smaller. If you want to take it all the way down to flour and you've got the equipment to deal with that, by all means be my guest. Here's a trick to dealing with these sort of things without exact measurements. Take the pot and fill it somewhere between one third and half full with grain. No water, just the corn. The reason we do this is it's an easy way to get a ratio of about three or three and a half to four of corn to water, uh, and we don't have to measure anything. So once you've got the corn in there and it's filled up to about that mark, start putting boiling water or really hot water in on top until you get it to a comfortable lever. Remember, we're gonna be stirring the crap out of this and it is gonna be bubbling a little bit, so don't get too carried away filling it all the way up to the tippy top. Give it a really good stir to make sure there's no big dough balls in there, make sure there's nothing sticking together, get it all mixed in and loose, and you can light the gas. 
Now this is considered a optional step, but in my mind, I have no idea why you wouldn't do this. I would suggest dosing with around about one third the uh, prescribed amount of enzymes right now. Yes, depending on the enzymes you have, you're probably going to denature them as you cook the corn, but before they die, they're gonna do a decent amount of work for us in thinning this mash out so you don't have to just deal with wet concrete later on. Bring it to a boil for one hour. During that boil, if you need to add a little bit more water to loosen it up because of evaporation or the corn swelling, please do so, make your life easy, uh, and obviously, don't stop stirring. Once it's been cooking for an hour, get all of the cooked corn over into the fermenter, insulate the fermenter, and repeat the whole process again. And again, rinse and repeat until you've cooked all of the corn and it's all in the fermenter. If you've made it this far in the process, nice work. In fact, I think you deserve a drink. How about a kick-ass cocktail? Real talk, I love cocktails. I think they're amazing, but I hate the fact that you need to collect up all of these random different ingredients just to make one drink. Today's sponsor, Shaker and Spoon, completely solved that problem for you. Shaker and Spoon are a monthly cocktail subscription box. They do the hard work and send out all the ingredients you'll need. The best news is that each box will create 12 cocktails, three different kinds of cocktails with four each, and they send all of the ingredients you need for them. Even better, every box focuses solely on one kind of alcohol, so you only need to buy one bottle to get through all 12 cocktails. You've been watching me make the Creole Sling from the All Eyes on Rye Shaker and Spoon box, and team, I gotta say, mm -mm. Yes, I totally could make this myself, but the convenience that Shaker and Spoon bring to the table means that I actually do make it instead of just talking about it. And to be fair, being prompted to try different things that you've never had before, I haven't had a Creole sling before, is really nice. So go to shakerandspoon.com slash stillit and use the code stillit to get $20 off your first Shaker and Spoon box. Now it's time to add your enzymes, specifically high temperature alpha MLAs. You'll often see it referred to as HTA in the industry. The thing to remember here guys is that different products have different requirements. Some of them have a stringent pH range you need to be in, they all have a temperature range that you need to be in, and those things can vary quite wildly depending on the product. At this point in time, I was under the impression that my enzymes worked in the range from uh, 80 degrees to 87 degrees Celsius. It's that in uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, so I cooled the mash down to 85 degrees Celsius and then added the enzymes in. Give it a really good stir, make sure it's all mixed in together, assess the, the thickness of the mash, if it's really thick still, you might wanna add a little bit of water in just to make the job on the enzymes a little bit easier. Uh, but get it to temperature, get the enzymes in there, cover it up, insulate the bejesus out of it and leave it for two hours. Unless of course your enzymes say a different amount of time. At the two hour mark, my mash unfortunately failed a starch test. Easy to carry on from there, just give it another really good stir, check that the temperature hasn't gotten too low for the range of your enzymes, cover it back up again, insulate it, and I let it go for another hour, at which point it passed the starch test. It turns out that I had bad information about the specific enzymes that I was working with, and they don't work in a range from 80 to 87, they work in a range from uh, 90 to 97. So basically I was mashing two gold and uh, that's why it took so freaking long to mash. But keep in mind guys too, you're working with stuff that isn't highly modified. This isn't like brewer's malted barley. The mash is gonna take some time. Now it's time to add the molasses and my molasses comes in a bucket. Uh, I was gonna use all of the molasses in the bucket. So the easiest way is to fill it up with boiling water, give it a stir, tip it into the fermenter, rinse and repeat until your bucket's nice and clean. At this point in time, we have a corny molasses -y goop, uh, and the enzymes have broken down uh, the really long chain starches in the corn into much, much shorter uh, sugar chains. But most of, or at least a, a large proportion of those sugar chains are still unfermentable to the yeast. So we've got one more enzyme step to get to here. So once again, these enzymes are gonna vary depending on the exact brand and type or whatever you have. But what you're looking for is glucoamylase. My stuff works between uh, 35 degrees Celsius and 65 degrees Celsius, which is a very generous range. Uh, so I cooled the mash down to 62 degrees Celsius just to be safe. I think the amount I used was 48 mils. 
If I'm wrong, I'll check my notes and, uh, and put it up here. The reason I'm not too worried about this is the dosing rates are almost certainly gonna be different on the exact stuff you have. So, you know, go with what's on the bottle, not what I'm seeing here. Anyway, covered it up, insulated it, left it overnight, which was about 12 hours. And in the morning, it was time to pop it open uh, and get it cooling back down to pitching temperature for our yeast. Like I said in the intro, I've been wanting to use this M1 yeast for a long ass time. I've talked to a bunch of professional distillers that I respect and really enjoy you know, their products. Uh, and a really high portion of them making whiskey are using M1 because they just think it is the bee's knees. Uh, and thank you to Soren from 1919 Distilling up in Auckland. Uh, I finally got the chance to use it. So thanks, man. I appreciate it, dude. I'll be honest with you guys. I often don't rehydrate my yeast, but when I'm doing something like this and it's kind of special to me, it's not just, you know, it's not an experiment. I'm not doing it for other reasons. I like to do things by the book. So yes, of course, I hydrated the yeast and pitched it on into the fermenter. The fermenter was covered up, but not under an airlock. It was insulated and it had a space heater directed at it controlled by an STC 1000 to keep it to a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. I'm going to be real with you guys. When it gets to distillation, dealing with corn can be kind of sucky if you don't have specialized equipment. The problem is we can't just whack that whole wash into the still with an electric element hanging out in there uh, because it is going to scorch. It's going to burn and you're not going to have a good time. If that happens, you're never going to get that burnt flavor out of it. But we can deal with this stuff, it just takes a bit of time and it's just a little bit messy, okay? So, uh, the first thing you want to do is just scoop as much liquid off the top of the grain bed. It would have settled if you gave it a couple of days. Get that liquid scooped off and straight on into your pot of your still. With a wash this size, you might get somewhere between, I don't know, 20 and 35, 40 litres of uh, relatively clear liquid that you can whack straight into the still, depending on how long you let it sit for. That can be your first run. You start the still up and you go to work straining the rest while the still's running, while you're in the area, and you're watching it, of course. There's a bunch of different ways you can go about this next part, guys. The most uh, basic, I guess, and, and easiest and needs the least equipment is just literally use some form of bag that is gonna act as a strainer. Scoop the mash into the bag, uh, let it strain through and drain, uh, and ideally having something that you can compress, squeeze, uh, and I find, you know, twisting it. So it restricts the grain and then squeezing it, twisting it again to restrict it further, squeeze it, so on and so forth. Uh, you can get through this stuff relatively quickly if you just roll your sleeves up and get stuck in. If you're going to be doing this kind of thing a whole lot, you can get those, uh, those mop squeezer buckety thingies, you know. <laughs> the ones the janitors always have in the movies. <laughs> Same deal, wake your corn on into the bag, give it a little bit of a squeeze, let it drip. Pop it in the mop bucket, squeeze it. Bob's your uncle, fans your aunt, you're on your way to having a tasty beverage distilled. But if you're a YouTuber, you might be spoiled and you might have equipment uh, that is literally capable of distilling something the consistency of porridge. So I'll be real with you guys, I only did one 25 litre stripping run on the T500. The rest of it was done on the Genio. And uh, I'm very thankful that I was able to do that. Once everything was stripped, I got all of the low wines back into my 50 litre keg still, made sure that they were proofed down to just below 40% and fired things up uh, for the spirit run. Yes, I was using some sight glasses as the column before my line arm. Uh, no, there was no bubble plates in there. I'm just playing around with having a different uh, shape and size column between the still and the line arm uh, for pot still runs, that's all. For cuts, I took 250 mils of four shots and whacked that straight on into the firelighter bottle. Uh, I then took another two liters of heads and popped those straight into the faints jars. At that point, I was starting to think maybe hearts were on the way, so I switched over to jars. Uh, I got through, oh man, I think it was uh, five jars in total. And in the end, I decided that Two of those jars were keepers. The first three went into the faints jar as well. Once I knew I was definitely in hearts, I switched over to big ass containers. There was no way I was gonna have literally a million glass jars lying around the shed for cuts. And kept running into these stainless steel stock pots until I was uh, starting to suspect that tails were coming soon, at which point I switched back over to jars, uh, which allowed me to, you know, take a little bit more time with them as the still was running to decide what I wanted to keep and what I wanted to throw into the faints. All of the hearts were then put back into a dirty great uh, 40 litre pot. They were proofed down to 63% and put into the barrel. You have no idea how much joy it brings me to be able to tell you that. 
<laughs> in case you're wondering, this barrel came from Barry's Barrels here in New Zealand. It's French toasted oak, and the reason I put uh, the spirit in at 62% is I was hoping uh, to hit somewhere around 58% for aging, for maturation, that's what I was aiming for, and because it had water in it beforehand, obviously, you know, it was soaked with water and the uh, ABV was going to drop almost instantly. So, it's only been in there literally for a couple of days, guys, and it's got a very, very slight amount of colour on it so far. And we're starting to get a crazily enough, a slight amount of oak on the nose already as well. I want to take a moment right now to say a huge, huge thank you to the Patreons. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, I thoroughly appreciate everything you do. I appreciate the tangible support, but uh, I really appreciate stuff like this. It was really, really freaking fun being able to uh, talk with a bunch of like-minded people about what was going to go into this barrel. I am sorry. I'm so sorry, guys, that it took me this long, uh, but it's somehow fitting to me that you know, the 100k barrel is now being filled after 200,000 subscribers. It's kind of hilarious to me. Anyway, uh, here's the deal, guys. I am really, really happy with the way this has turned out. And I'm really excited to see what it's going to turn into in the future. The nose is interesting and it's kind of, uh, it has a, an air of mystique to me because it's straight away, uh, the first thing I get is a slight, subtle hint of just general rumminess. And it isn't a dirty, great, big, heavy, uh, like double pot still Jamaican dark molasses kind of thing to me. It's not like that. It is, it's not exactly Bacardi either. <laughs> the actual flavors being contributed by the molasses are bold, but they're pretty uh, and they're quite subtle. They're not slapping you around the head like a pot stilled Jamaican once again. Right in behind that, there's a hit of the dusty corn, which to me always presents almost like green apple. Like it, that kind of corn is not sweet corn, it's not popcorn. It's dusty classic bourbon corn. Those are the flavors that are coming through on the nose. On the palate, it is pretty similar, but there's just something about this that is a little bit more next level, I think, than a lot of other things I've made. It's going to be very interesting to see how it ages over time and I would love to ferment more things with M1 yeast to see if perhaps, perhaps that is part of the reason why I'm enjoying this so much. In any case, I can 100% understand why people love the sweet feed concept on the forums so much. If you're someone that has been making that a fair bit, please chime in in the comment section down below. Let me know how you think this compares to it, both in uh, concept ingredients and outcome but I'll be honest with you guys this is something that I'm going to really enjoy uh, you know taking a little sample from every now and again seeing how it's going I'm planning on keeping it right here on the bench uh, and if you guys want regular updates on it I'm more than happy to do that for you so if you've enjoyed this video please guys please give it a thumbs up that helps me out a whole lot it really does YouTube loves that shit uh, drop a comment in the comment section down below like I said if you've had experience with something similar to this or if you've just got something interesting to say about it and if you're watching this video and you're not subscribed yet what are you doing come on hit the subscribe button and the notification bell and and I'll catch you next time guys keep chasing the craft see ya